Before I begin, I want to uh, point your attention to the March 28 LA Adventist Forum at Glendale City Church with Yi Shin Ma, who's a PhD student at Claremont School of Theology. It's interesting, many of you know I'm in school there, and there are probably, at first I thought there were only two or three of us who were Adventists, but there are probably seven to nine of us uh, in graduate studies there in one program or another. Uh, and Yishin Mana is, is one of those. And so I'm just going to give him a little shout out as an acquaintance and say, take advantage of, of what people are learning in these places. And uh, if you can get down to Glendale for an afternoon, it's kind of a, a fun thing to do. Uh, for those of you who have also known I'm sick or have been sick and have been praying for me, thank you. I am doing, I'm doing better. Um, the miracle that we need to pray for today is that my pants will stay up. Um, that is a worthy thing thing to pray for. Um, I, I've I've got my belt tightened uh, to the right notch, and uh, the pants are, are crimped in to kind of stay there. And these are these are my skinny pants. So um, yeah, it's next week really ought to be uh, interesting. So uh, come one, come all. Um, we've been talking about sin and the kind of antiquated notion that it is in relationship to contemporary society. It's not a word that we, we talk much about. It's not a word that we embrace so much anymore. Uh, it's, it's become a source of mockery, and in some ways Christians deserve that. I, I mean, I can really remember as a child trying to break down sin and having whole camp meetings where the speakers were trying to help us understand at what point a thought was simply a temptation and at what point it crossed over from too much fondling of that thought into the realm of sin. And uh, just lots and lots of things that have to do with what we understand to be sort of normal humanity in life were uh, classified in terms of sin, and so it's not surprising that the movie industry and people who used to be Christians or were raised with this, uh, uh, sitcoms, uh, the, the society at large has chosen to use sin as a term of mockery, and uh, how Christians have sort of migrated away from that is we've developed a stronger and more sophisticated sense of history, psychology, anthropology, humanity and an understanding of, of the life situation in which we live, as well as the very complex sort of structures of sin, if you will, in our world and the way in which we participate in those. My attempt last week was to remind us that without that language, though, without a sense of having, having sin in our lives, that is to say something that's destructive of ourselves, something destructive of our relationships with others, particularly uh, family, friends, uh, God, church, society. These are the kind of things that are, are, are clearly working against us in our lives. These are things sometimes we still pursue and engage and still take on and suffer for. We'll talk a little bit about that a little more today. But without this language of sin and then the concomitant language that goes with it, the language that helps us deal with sin is a language of confession. Because of our litigious society, we don't want to admit guilt quickly or freely. I didn't do it, Your Honor. That is, not guilty is our plea every single time. It was the other guy. Well, it was only because of X, Y, Z. I wouldn't have done this otherwise, but these circumstances forced me to choose this. We're a society and a people of excuses. There is no such thing as personal responsibility. The, bus, the buck must be passed. And so we've moved not only away from a language of sin, but we've moved away from a language of confession in the Latin Mea culpa. I am guilty. And the irony is that nothing can free us faster than the mea culpa. We can spin our wheels all day long trying to profess our great innocence 
or the circumstances. Oh, but just see, Lord, the woman that you gave me, she picked the fruit and handed it to me. It's her fault. It wasn't mine. I didn't have a choice in this matter. I'm not a sentient being who knew the rules. I'm not responsible for her in any way. I'm going to pass the buck to her. And welcome to thousands of years of the oppression of women since. It was their fault. They're the weaker sex, you see. They're the inferior of mind and moral character. The responsibility lies with them, you see, Lord. See the problems that we've inherited structurally, corporately, because we wouldn't go to the mea culpa from the very beginning? I was naked, and I hid from you. Who said you were naked? We have that sense, don't we? And the fastest way to relief the fastest way to forgiveness, the fastest way to grace and hope and peace is mea culpa. There are a number of confessions we can make. Lord, I believe. Okay, help my unbelief. Do you hear the confession? Lord, I don't believe. I need a sign. Ah, but it is a wicked generation that seeks a sign and an unbelieving one. Help me. I don't know how long ago it was. I lose track of time very easily. A week, a year, a month, two years. But I talked about a book entitled Help, Thanks, Wow. Remember that? I'm even going blank right now on who the author is, but she's fantastic. And those are three prayers that this author was talking about as the shortest possible prayers and maybe the most efficacious. They're certainly powerful. Help would move us toward the urgency of something we need by way of divine intervention, divine company, divine assistance. But embedded in that could also be the mea culpa. And if there is a fourth prayer that was left out of that, it would be I'm mea culpa, I have sinned. That would be the one that I think would be the other prayer most useful to us. Help can summon all kinds of aid from God. Wow expresses this deep sense of awe and wonder that we have when we encounter God in person or in creation. Thanks expresses gratitude, which is the basis of our very happiness. And mea culpa becomes the basis of our freedom. Lord, I've sinned. I have behaved in a way that was destructive of my spirit, disintegrative toward my soul, ruinous where my body is concerned. Lord, I have sinned. I have stepped on the toes of someone I love. Lord, I have sinned. I have failed to love. And I have hated my friend, my brother, and worse, my enemy. Lord, I have not been my brother's keeper or sister's keeper. Lord, I have alienated society or brought harm against another individual. Lord, I have used someone. I have manipulated someone. I have taken advantage of someone. I have desired things of someone I had no right to desire. I have sought my own gain. I have sought my own pleasure. I have sought 
my own purposes. I have not paid attention to the life around me. I have violated creation. I've not, you get the idea. This mea culpa has so many functions because it helps us, first of all, identify those things that we are doing or that are part of our lives that are self-destructive. It's an immediate recognition of damage done in a relationship, and it's the first step in helping us to repair that. It is the best way to maintain equilibrium in a society in which, I hate to say this, but it is inevitable we will offend or step on someone's toes. Inevitable. Careful as we might be, inevitable. The I am sorry is the balm that gets us past that, and the seeking understanding is that which helps us grow. You see, here's the trick with the image of God. We were all created in the image of God. That means that your difference from me is no less a creation of God's image. That means that as image bearers, we are each uniquely image bearers and must learn who God is through the image of God embedded in creation and redemption in one another. And Christ doesn't redeem us in the same uniformity any more than he created us in that. He redeems us each in our uniqueness. And he calls us and gifts us each in our uniqueness. The path to freedom, wholeness, the path to life starts with the confession. And you don't have confession if you don't have a sense of sin, responsibility, or even guilt. Now, guilt can play a destructive role in your life. It has in mine in various points. It can play a destructive role in your spirituality. God doesn't want us to go through life feeling guilty. God wants us to go through life free happy, able to do that which he's, in, he's gifted us and set us free to do, the good works for which we were created from the beginning of creation. This is what he wants for us, not guilt. He's not interested in your guilt or your offerings any more than a wife who's been beaten multiple times is interested in another bouquet of flowers. God wants something deeper from us. He wants us to live in a way that is honest and open and transparent. We've been studying the life of David in 2 Samuel. This guy is anything but righteous, in my view. This guy is anything but straight up and pure, in my view. This guy is anything but clean, in my view. And yet he is the man after God's own heart. That is a statement not of ontology or his being. That's a statement of his redemption. And in his redemption, as we read the Psalms, nobody comes cleaner than David. Nobody is more quick to speak to God about his senses and feelings and concerns and to confess his sins. He's very upfront. Very honest. This is the power of God in us. This is the power of redemption at work in us. First, that we are able to understand what sin is and how it harms us. And secondly, that we are able at some level to acknowledge it and seek forgiveness. And the more of this that happens, the more we move from a place of enslavement to a place of freedom, from a place of illness to a place from a place of harm to a place of safety. Forgive me, but I'm going to go back over our text this morning so that we can apply that which we've heard and learned in this particular lesson. Sin accompanied by suffering is the norm. If we go to our Old Testament passage, we can read beyond the few verses I had read publicly for today in Numbers 21, 4, and 5, and we can see what ended up happening by way of suffering. Numbers 21, 4, and 5. 
Now, for some reason, I'm in the wrong chapter. That always hurts. Maybe this will help. The bronze snake. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient. Now, they didn't just grow impatient. We all grow impatient. They started honking their horns. They rolled down their windows and shook their fists. They flipped the bird. They spoke against God and against Moses. You understand? Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Is that why God brought them out of Egypt? I thought it was to worship him in freedom and peace. There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. Oh, yes, there was bread, manna from heaven that could be formed into a bread. I think I'd get tired of that after a time, too, and so I'm not as hard on the people as might be. But the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and they bit the people, and many Israelites died. Then the people came to Moses because they got the message. All is not well in the camp of Israel. All is not peace. We've moved from a place of safety to a place of harm. We've moved from a place where we're moving toward redemption to a place where we've moved to death. The Lord said to Moses, Ah, excuse me. The people said, We have sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses did. He prayed for the people. Prophet, advocate, leader, he prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. When we look to the sacrifice of Calvary, we look at that which has been placed on a pole to atone. We look at life. And this is the irony of the cross. In looking at the misery of the crucifixion and the death and the horror, we find in it life. Life sacrificed and life emergent in resurrection. And this is the trajectory of our weeks. The Son of Man will also be lifted up. It is this death we will mourn, and it is this resurrection we will celebrate. And it is this to which we have culpability. Let us not grow impatient in the journey, lest we have to create something to look up at and be healed from. There's much deeper connections, aren't there? Let's read the psalm. Of course, we give thanks for he is good and his love endures forever and he gathers all. But let's look at 17. Some become fools through their rebellious ways and suffered if affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and grew near the gates of death. They cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing word, love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. Your act of worship will be deepened by your act of of confession. Your act of worship will be deepened by your acceptance of his forgiveness. Your act of worship will be deepened as you sing the praises of the one who made you and redeemed you and freed you and called you his own. That will be a deepening of your act of worship. But let's listen to the psalmist for just a minute. Some became fools through their rebellious ways. I would suggest 
that we bring much of the misery that we experience upon ourselves. You ever get a flat tire on a trip to an important meeting and it made you late? But as you reflected back, you hadn't checked your tire pressure for six months and you'd been running low on air and you just didn't want to take the time to get it filled or patched. You just brought a misery on yourself. I was almost late for church a couple months ago because I couldn't be bothered to fill up my car with gas during the week. And so three feet from the top of the on-ramp at Lyons, I ran out of gas and had to stop. My momentum would no longer take me over that three foot of crest where I could have coasted in safety to a gas station. I didn't suffer terribly, but I did have to get out of my vehicle and walk and find a gas container, and I got gas all over myself, and I had to get some gas in the car just to get to church. Not suffering, but I was a fool not to fill up my tank with gas. We're fools in much more profound ways, aren't we? We're fools with our money. The Bible says a fool and his money are soon parted. And most of us are parted with our money really quickly. We don't bother to invest where thief cannot steal and rust cannot destroy and moth cannot destroy. We're fools with our health. We think everything is fine and normal until it isn't. I am always stunned when somebody says, why did God take him away? And he was 5'7 and 350 pounds. Did God take him away? Was it God's will that he suffer and have a heart attack at 48? Or is there something else going on? We live in complex cycles that affect us. And yet we have choices to make. And it's always amazing when somebody headed for disaster doesn't see the ways in which they're headed for disaster, but when they get there, it is somehow God's fault. It is somehow God's responsibility to have keep, kept them from that or to keep them from future harm in that. I've got news for all of us, myself included. None of us are immune from the laws of money, of nature. None of us are immune from the laws of health. Some of us have constitutions that allow us to abuse ourselves longer than other people, but it catches up with us. Now, by way of saying that, I think that while my sickness is not entirely of my choosing or fault, there's no doubt that the stress, the lifestyle, the food choices I made leading up to it affected me. There's no doubt that there's a component of personal responsibility in my mind. And I have suffered affliction because of my iniquity. I got to the point of loathing all food and felt like I was going to near the gate of death. You see, what is food associated with? It's associated with life, with family, friendships, social occasions, celebration, sweetness, savory, sour. It's associated with salty, taste. It's associated with everything that we think of as good. So what does it mean when we loathe all food and are nearing the gates of death? That's what our rebellion, that's what our sin does to us personally. It removes us from the feast of the Lord and from goodness. But listen to the good news. You didn't think good news existed in the Old Testament. It does. They cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, and he rescued them from the grave. Jesus did that so many times, didn't he? He sent out his word and healed 
to the centurion. He said, I don't need to go to your house. The centurion told Jesus, you don't need to come to my house. Just say the word. Jesus said, I've never seen faith like this in all of Israel. Go. And when the centurion went and went home, his servant was healed. Jesus sent forth his word. When God sends forth his word, healing takes place. You see? Healing, grace, forgiveness. Ephesians, very pointed. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. It's pretty pointed. These transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air whose spirit is now at work in those who are disobedient. That's a very odd phrase. It doesn't resonate with us in the slightest we don't know what he's talking about. The kingdom of the air, this is bizarre. But to a cosmology where you have a layered universe, the kingdom of the air is beneath the heavens and beneath certainly the layers of the heavens and beneath the God of the heavens. And the kingdom of the air is no less than the one who was cast from that heaven and bound to this earth who's now at work at those in those who are disobedient. When we live our lives in rebellion, when we live our lives in sin, it is not God whose work is in work among us. It is someone else's. Paul goes into more descriptors. Craving the uh, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. And therefore we say it is by grace that you have been saved. And God resurrected us with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by your works or anyone's works, because no one may boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. This is our healing, and this is our hope. This is a direction as we move toward the cross, because in the gospel reading it says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes might have life in him. When we live lives of duplicity and deceit, when we seek to take advantage, when we're usurious, when we exploit others, when we take advantage of their poverty or their ignorance, when we take advantage of their weakness, or their position. We're not living according to what God would have us do. We're children of darkness. We don't want to be exposed. We want to stay hidden. We don't want our deeds known because they would be shameful. We hide. We run to the bushes because we know we are naked. But when light comes to the world and people choose light and love light and live in light and come to truth in life, light, what they do is to be seen by all. For there is no judgment for right doing. What is it that you want? As we race toward Easter, the cross and the resurrection, where is it that you want your hopes pinned? 
How is it that you want to be? Are you able to understand suffering, at least in part, in terms of sin? Are you willing to do the mea culpa? Are you available to let God know how broken you are and to confess what he already sees and knows? Are you ready to listen to his counsel or receive his grace? Call for his healing? Are you ready to move into light and become children of light? As he is light? You see, John said it so plainly, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Him was light, and that light was the life of all men. May we all choose life. And as we respond this morning to the grace that is ours, May we be generous as the deacons now stand and collect our offering.